If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, or somebody around you does, you can look on with. Let me invite you to open with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. It is good to be back with you. I've been looking so forward to being here today, and uh, not only in this room, obviously, with Loudoun, Prince William, and Montgomery County. When I, when I started studying uh, this text in preparation for this weekend, my plan was to preach the second half of Acts chapter 17. So verses 16 through 34, it's kind of the next uh, kind of segment in this series in Acts. But the more I looked at these verses, the more and then prayed through what God is saying in this text to this church, I was immediately drawn to two verses in particular, verses 26 and 27. And the more I looked at, at these two verses, the more I just believed that there is a specific word here for this church in this place at this time. So I was talking to Lon and I said, I'm thinking about covering just two verses and focusing on this one particular theme. And he said, that sounds great. I'll cover the second half of Acts 17 as a whole next week. So Today, I simply want to read two verses from the middle of Paul's sermon to a group of philosophers in Athens. And then after I read these verses, I want to tell you a story from somewhere else in the world. And I'll go ahead and warn you, this story is going to take some time, more time than I would take in a normal sermon. But I want to take time to tell this story in a way that I hope will help us understand these two verses. And then I want all of this, I hope, to see, help us see why these two verses are so important for McLean Bible Church today. So, does that sound good? Well, even if it doesn't, we're still going to do it. So, uh, but uh, just trying to be kind. All right, so, <laughs> all right, let's start with the word. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. This is the middle of Paul's sermon uh, on Mars Hill. Verse 26 says, and God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having t determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for the way you speak to us through your word. Thank you for time studying this word uh, leading up to today and the way you spoke through your word then. And, and we pray now that you would take these words that you spoke through Paul 2,000 years ago and that you would speak clearly through them to our hearts in this time and this place. Help us. We pray in the next few minutes to understand what these verses mean and to see how they change the way we look at and live in the world around us. So help us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here's the story. It starts with an eight-year-old boy named Samir. Samir has two sisters. One is five years old, named Amira, and the other is Raja, a baby girl born six months ago. Together, they lived in Syria with their father, mother, and grandmother. Samir's parents worked hard to provide for their family in a quaint village of about 4,000 people. Well, it used to be quaint. Their village was situated on the border of three different provinces in Syria. And over recent years, it became trapped in a triangle of terror. The Syrian army on one side, the Free Syrian army on the other side, and the Russian army in the middle. Samir vividly remembers the first time a bomb landed in his village. He was inside the house playing with Amira when the door suddenly flew open. Samir's dad, out of breath from running home as fast as he could, began yelling, get out of the house. And a minute later, they were all huddled together in a makeshift shelter while the sound of bombshells shot around them. Shrapnel littered the streets in a sure sign of these Syrian villagers that their quaint homes had suddenly become a war zone. In the days to come, bombs would fall more and more frequently, and little eight-year-old Samir started turning into an anxious, 
cowering, stuttering version of himself. He was too scared to sleep at night, just waiting to wake up his sister, sprint with his family to the shelter at any moment. One night when he couldn't sleep, he overheard his parents talking. His father told his mother, we can't stay here anymore. We need to go somewhere else. To which Samir's mom asked the obvious question, where? For generations, their families had lived and worked in this village. Syria is all they'd ever known. Where would they go? How would they support themselves? Samir's dad shared how he'd heard that if they could just get across Turkey to the Aegean Sea, they could cross over to Greece and there they'd be free. If only they could get to Greece, then they would have passage into the rest of Europe and they could start over. Samir's mom immediately expressed concern, saying, do you really think we can travel with your mom and three kids, including a six-month-old baby, hundreds of miles across Syria and Turkey? And then how do we get across the Aegean Sea to Europe, she asked, and who's to say they won't turn us right around when we get there? I don't know, Samir's dad said as he sunk into silence. But after a long pause, he spoke again and said, I also don't know any other option. We either stay here and die or we risk our lives and go. Within days, the family was packed. Everybody but the baby had a bag to carry, and just like that, generations of history and an entire family's possessions were reduced to five plastic sacks, one of which contained all the money Samir's mother and father had saved. They set out on foot. It was about a three-day trip to the Turkish border. The first night, their family spent in an abandoned coal factory. The next night was spent in a stable. The third day posed the greatest challenge, a massive mountain to cross on foot at the Turkish border, about a nine-hour trek with the sounds of bullets and bombs nearby. They ran out of water about halfway through. Samir's dad was now carrying Amira, his mom was carrying Raja, the baby, and Samir and his grandmother were plodding along behind together. Every one of them was ready to quit if it weren't for the others pushing them along. But they finally reached Turkey in need of rest and relief, neither of which they would find. You see, ever since refugees began trekking across Turkey, an entire industry of exploitation has begun. Refugees need simple goods, water, food, supplies for the journey to the coast, and a swath of smugglers are there to charge exorbitant prices for everything they need. Samir's dad had no choice but to pay whatever they asked to get whatever his family needed. He saw his money slowly slipping away, yet the highest sum was left to come. A ferry across the Aegean would cost you or me about $17. But smugglers were charging refugees $1,000 to $2,000 a piece for each member of a family, including infants, to cross to the other side. And they wouldn't be crossing on a ferry. They'd be crossing either on a small boat or on a rubber dinghy, a raft made for about 30 people with no guarantee that it would make it to the other side. Samir heard the people telling the stories. The day before, 34 people, including 15 children and four toddlers, had drowned when an overcrowded boat capsized due to storms and high winds. Those 34, 34 joined approximately 2,500 people who have died trying to get to Greece across the Aegean. That great sea has literally become a graveyard. The journey is delicate, depending on everything from weather conditions to armed criminals. Masked men on jet skis are known to attack boats, smashing into them with sticks, threatening to drown them if they won't surrender whatever valuables they have with them. After a while, Samir and his dad met a man who said he could get them across for $1,800 apiece. That'd be over $10,000 for Samir's family. Samir's dad knew that would come close to draining his savings, savings, but what choice did he have? The living conditions in Turkey were harsh. There's a reason people are spending their savings and risking their lives to leave that country. So Samir's dad reluctantly agreed. The smuggler said, I'll try to get you into a more sturdy boat, but we'll see. Just keep your phone by your side. I'll call you when it's time. Samir and his dad went back to the hostel where the rest of the family was waiting where they were staying. They gave them the news, told them they needed to be ready at any time. So that night, they received a call from the smuggler. He said, too much rain and wind, we can't go tonight. The next night, the same message came, and the next, and the next, and the next, until some nights a message never even came. His hope was fading fast until 
One night, the phone rang suddenly. The voice of the smuggler on the other end said, you can travel on a rubber dinghy tonight. Come to the meeting place immediately. And just like that, Samir's dad had a choice. He'd waited for weeks, hoping his family would be on a boat more sturdy, safe, secure than a small rubber dinghy amidst the crashing Aegean waves. Now he had minutes to decide if he was ready to risk his family's life on a dinghy. In utter exhaustion from the journey by this point, Samir's dad thought, this may be our only chance. So he said to his family, grab your bags, let's go. Soon they were crammed into a small van with other refugees making their way through alleys toward a hidden crag in the sea. And there a raft built for 30 people was waiting for 60 refugees arriving in the vans. They began loading the raft one by one, cramming in closely next to each other. And as each of them climbed in, they were immediately cold, able to feel the freezing temperature from the water around them. One of the refugees was appointed by the smugglers to drive the boat, a task this man and no one else on the boat had ever done. The smugglers started the engine, pushed them out to shore, and thus began the longest three hours of Samir's short life. Just imagine being crammed into that boat on the water with your family. See the pitch black darkness around you. Feel the shiver of the sea as its waves toss you back and forth. Hear the sound of people screaming in fear as a man who's never driven a boat before nervously navigates the Aegean Sea with 60 lives in his hands. Samir looked over at his mom and saw fear on her face for the first time in this journey. She clutched his baby sister tightly, knowing that if she or the baby were to fall off now, there's no way their daughter would live. By the sheer mercy of God, they made it to the other side. But the journey was far from over. A 40-mile walk led them to a processing center where they would wait in line for papers, for food, for water, for clothing, for everything. It didn't take long to feel more like cattle than people. But the refugee camp there was a short-term stay. Their goal was to get to the border of Macedonia as soon as possible. There, they heard, was the easiest access en route to Germany, the place where most of these refugees wanted to end up. So after a night in the camp, Samir's dad wanted them to waste no time, and the journey continued. They caught a bus to a nearby city, about 52 miles south of the Macedonian border. When they arrived there, Samir's dad looked at his wife, kids, mother, realized they did not have the energy for a 52-mile walk. So he found a taxi driver who agreed to take them to the border for the equivalent of about $300, nearly all of the family's remaining money. Hesitantly, Samir's dad gave the driver the $300 and the family climbed into the taxi. 20 minutes later though, the driver abruptly stopped and told them to get out of the car. Samir's dad protested. He said, I paid you to take us to the border. I gave you the money you asked us to take us to the border. The taxi driver wouldn't listen. He said, I'm not taking you any further. I've taken you as far as you've paid me to take you. I will only take you farther if you pay me more. Samir's dad said, I can't pay you more. I don't have any more to pay you. And the driver responded, then you and your family need to get out. And so they did. And for the next two days, they trudged along using the last pennies they had to buy small sips of water and snacks for food. They arrived at the Macedonian border, exhausted and dehydrated. But this was their destination. The destination everyone had said was the place where passage into inner Europe became a reality. But nothing could have prepared them for what they found when they arrived. The Macedonian border had just closed a few days before. And passage into inner Europe was now blocked. And this refugee camp made for 2,000 people was now filled with 15,000 people. All of the established tents were taken. The only option for shelter was a thin, small tent made for two or three people for the family out in the field. That tent was barely enough for the six of them to sit in, much less lie down. By now, it was getting close to dark, so Samir went with his dad to stand in line for food, water, and blankets while his mom, sisters, and grandmother waited in the tent. The temperature was dropping. It was going to be a cold night. And so they stood in separate lines, the dad in one and the eight-year-old in the other. And as they stood in line, the rain began to fall. 
freezing rain, relentless rain that wouldn't stop. Two hours later, with a couple of blankets and a portion of food, Samir and his dad returned to the tent, zipped it open, only to discover the entire family shivering wet as water was creeping into the tent from above and below them. Quickly, Samir and his dad crammed in and zipped the tent closed. They passed the blankets to the girls. Samir and his dad would go without. Similarly, the food and water, it didn't take long for their meager meal to be finished. They were all exhausted, so they did their best to situate themselves to sleep. The adults propped up while the kids lay down on them. They sat and lay there in the relative silence of the tent with cold water seeping in among them, freezing rain pelting around them, and that's when it happened. They broke. They all broke. It started when Raja, this now sweet seven-month-old baby girl whose name means hope, began coughing in the cold. And when Samir's dad heard the sound of his baby girl getting sick, he could no longer hold it in anymore. As she coughed, he began to cry. You see, earlier while he was waiting in line for food and water, he had heard other men talking about a new government plan to export Syrian refugees from Greece back to Turkey. Up until this point, every step of the way, he'd held out hope for his family in the future. But now, crammed into this cold tent with no money to his name and no hope for a better tomorrow, nothing could hold back his tears. He wept. His wife, cuddled up next to him, followed in turn. And then his mom, and then Amira, and finally Samir. They all cried uncontrollably as Samir's dad said over and over again to his family, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. They cried that night until they were weary from their weeping. Without another word spoken, they all fell asleep, a family with no hope for anything the next morning might hold. Now I need to tell you that this is not just one true story. This is a conglomeration of different true stories of different individuals and different families, some of whom I've met. And I had heard and read stories like these. And to be perfectly honest, I hadn't paid much attention to them. I'd watch the news on TV or read something online or on my phone, but in the next minute, I had changed the channel to sports or click on something else. But everything changed when I found myself late one night on the Macedonian border walking in this sea of tents swimming in mud as freezing rain fell on them, looking at the lines of men and women and children standing, listening to the sounds of their children crying and their babies coughing, children the same age as my kids, men and women just like you and just like me living in a semblance of hell on earth. And these are not just a few stories here or there. These are stories that are repeated over and over and over again among millions of people. We live in a day of massive international migration, much of it forced. Never before in all of history have so many people been displaced, put in danger, or forced from their homes. We know about the Syrian refugee crisis. 22 million people in Syria, and over half of them, 11 million people, have now either been displaced or killed. And I wonder how many followers of Christ are like I was paying passing, if any, attention to this. Or if we are paying attention to it, we're looking at it through primarily political lenses. And I want to be really, really, really careful here because I know there are countless complicated political questions surrounding refugees and immigration, and there are no easy answers. We, we know from Romans chapter 13 that it is good and right under God for government to protect and promote the safety and security of her people. 
And particularly in light of another event in London last night, we praise God for men and women who are giving their lives to protect and promote our safety and security. And we know there's much debate in our country today surrounding these issues. We pray for wisdom and the leaders of our government, some of whom are in this church, some of whom I was talking with after this gathering. All of this, I just want to be clear. My aim today is in no way to dive into this issue politically. Instead, my aim is to remind us that in the church, far before we listen to what the world says about refugees or even immigrants, we must listen to what the Word says about refugees and immigrants. And in Acts 17, verses 26 and 27, God has spoken about these things. And it is incumbent upon us in the church in a day of massive international migration to make sure that our view of the world is shaped by biblical principles more than it is by political punditry. So what does God say? What does God say about the movement of peoples in the world? What does God say? Hear his word in Acts 17, 26. At least four clear truths here. You, you might write them down. One, God creates all people with equal dignity. God creates all people with equal dignity. Acts 17, verse 26 says, God made from one man every nation of mankind. So here and the beginning of history, the beginning of the Bible, teaches us that we have a common ancestry. All of us come from one man and one woman. Every single one of us in history and all the world today, every single one of us created in the image of God. And this was so significant for these Athenians in Acts 17 because they basically divided the world into two classes of people. You were either a Greek or a barbarian. So Paul's words here were an all-out blow to Greek national pride as he basically said, hey, Jews and Athenians, we're all the same. This was huge for them to hear, and it's huge for us to remember. So part of the reason I wanted to take the time to share this story is to remind us that these moms and dads and grandparents and kids are just like you and me and our families. And the Bible beckons us to remember that far before refugees and immigrants are problems to be solved, they are people like you and me. And no one person is superior to another. No Caucasian is superior to an Arab. No Arab superior to an Asian. No Asian superior to a Latin American. No Latin American superior to an African American. And on and on and on. We all have equal dignity and worth and value before God. He makes this clear. We must remember, we all have equal dignity. God creates all people with equal dignity. And then, truth number two, God designs different people groups with distinct beauty. God designs different people groups with distinct beauty. So he made from one man every nation of mankind. So the word there for nation is not just a reference to geopolitical entities like we think of nations today, around 200 United Nations. No, the word here for nation is ethnos. It refers to ethnic groups, people groups, groups of people who share common language, cultural characteristics, which makes sense, right? We know in most any geopolitical nation, there are a variety of ethnicities, a variety of people groups. The United States of America is filled with a multiplicity of people groups. For that matter, this church is filled with a multiplicity of people groups. You may have seen the video a few weeks ago in worship. 106 different nations, ethnic groups, people groups represented in this one church. Each of them designed with distinct beauty. And notice what Acts 17, 26 is teaching. Ethnicity is not an accident. Ethnicity is not simply a product of random genetic change. No, ethnicity is part of intentional divine design. God creates different people groups with distinct beauty. And according to the next verse, so verse 27, God's design is not merely to create different people groups. Truth number three, God wills to be sought, found, 
enjoyed and worshiped by every people group in the world. God wills to be sought, found, enjoyed, and worshiped by every people group in the world. God has made from one man every nation, every people group of mankind so that, so here's the purpose clause in these two verses, so that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. God wills for every people group in the world to seek him to find him, to enjoy him, to worship him. This is from the very beginning of the Bible. It's interesting. Way back in the start of Scripture, Genesis chapter 10, we have the table of nations, the separation of people groups. But then it's right after that that God calls Abraham to be the father of the people of Israel. And he blesses Abraham and promises blessing to the people of Israel. So you might think, oh, so God wills to be sought, found, enjoyed, and worshiped by one people group in the world, the people of Israel. But that's not what God says to Abraham. No, God says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 3, we look, 1 through 3, we looked at this a few months ago. Abraham, he says, I'm going to bless you and your people so that through you and your people, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. All the peoples. God wants his goodness and blessing known among all all the people groups of the world. So that's clear from the very beginning of the Bible all the way to the end. So this morning in my quiet time, I was in Revelation chapter 5, just so happened to be there in my Bible reading plan. And the song that the angels are singing in heaven to Jesus, they're singing about how by his blood he ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Nation, ethno, same word that's in Acts 17, 26 that I'm looking at in my Bible at the end of the Bible this morning. Jesus died so that God might be sought, found, enjoyed, and worshiped forever by every people group in the world. So anthropologists estimate that over 11,000 people groups exist in the world today, ethnic groups, and God, our God, aims to be sought, found, enjoyed, and worshiped by every single one of them. So all of that then... To put this together leads to the fourth truth, a truth tucked right in the middle of these two verses. It's the last part of Acts 17, verse 26. God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Listen to this. Having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. So, third truth, God wills to be sought, found, and joined in worship by every people group in the world. And fourth truth, God oversees the movement of people groups for the accomplishment of this purpose. God oversees the movement of people groups for the accomplishment of this purpose. Did you hear that? God is determining the periods, verse 26 says, when people groups live, and God is directing the boundaries of where they live. Let, let that soak in. God has determined the boundaries of where people groups live. Oh, knowing that totally changes our perspective on the movement of people and people groups in the world around us, doesn't it? I mean, nothing is happening in the world right now by accident. This unprecedented migration of people groups is not happening by accident today. Who is ultimately overseeing it all? God is. This is evident throughout Scripture. Think about the Old Testament. As God raises up people and he sends them there. As God scatters nations and disperses them here. Think about how God, at his appointed time, he sent Israel to Egypt, and at his appointed time, he delivered Israel out of Egypt. God orchestrated the whole exile from Jerusalem. God orchestrated the return to Jerusalem. Even as we're reading through the book of Acts, we see God sovereignly scattering his church from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So, when we see the migration of people due to a multiplicity of different reasons, we must realize that it's all ultimately occurring under the governance of God. Now we know there's a mystery to how this works in light of rampant evil and sinfulness in the world. But see the mercy of God here. For Acts 17 says the ultimate purpose of God is to bring every people group in the world to seek, find, enjoy, and worship Him. And ladies and gentlemen, this is happening 
So one of the other reasons I wanted to take time to share that story is to illustrate how this is happening. Even amidst the tragedy of the refugee crisis that surrounds us, people who have never heard the gospel are hearing it for the first time and believing it. Syrians and Afghans, Iraqis, Kurds. One Syrian woman said in the camp, I'm tired of being tied to a religion that doesn't offer me hope. Where can I find hope? And she heard the gospel and she, her husband, and their friend all placed their faith in Christ and were baptized outside the camp. Two Kurdish brothers whose family had been killed by radicals in Iraq, including their parents, right in front of their eyes, they straight up said, we don't want to belong to our religion anymore. We want to follow Jesus. While he was standing in line for water, one Palestinian-born man who was raised in Syria because of conflict in Palestine, so picture his life. He's fled from conflict in Palestine. Now he's fleeing from civil war in Syria. He's separated from his wife and children, not sure if or how in the world he'll ever unite with them. He saw a friend of mine distributing water, pulled him aside, asked him two questions. First, he said, do you speak Arabic? To which my friend said, yes. The second question was, then can you tell me how to become a Christian? I could go on with story after story. I, I got a text the other day saying that eight new believers were baptized in one refugee camp. And do you see this? Today, right now, right now, God is turning even the tragedy of forced migration into the triumph of future salvation for people around the world. So why then, why, why, why might there be a particular word here for McLean Bible Church? Why might we need to hear this word today? Is it because God is calling McLean to send more people from here around the world for the spread of God's love among more people groups in the world? Well, yes, I don't see how that can't be part of the reason why we need to understand these verses. But that's not primarily why, as I prayed, I found myself pausing here and preparing for this weekend. The primary reason I, in pausing, and so I was praying through this text, verses 26 and 27 this week, and couldn't help but think that there's a specific word here for McLean Bible Church is not only because God is sending more people to go around the world from McLean, but also because God is bringing a lot of people from around the world to McLean. So hear this loud and clear, brothers and sisters, in Acts 17, verses 26 and 27. Yes, yes, God is calling people from here to go to the nations. And God is also calling a lot of people from the nations to come here. So I came across a study Penn State uh, University did on ethnic diversity in the U.S. and they ranked the metro D.C. region as one of the most ethnically diverse regions in the entire country. The report talked about all kinds of factors uh, here in the Washington metro area, employment opportunities in government, the military, higher education. They talked about how many more rural, largely white communities have transformed in recent years into sprawling suburbs filled with white, black, Asian, Hispanic, multiracial residents. And the numbers prove it. Thousands and thousands of Ethiopians, as we heard earlier, 115,000 Vietnamese in the DMV, 80,000 Nepalese, 45,000 Thai and Laotians, 15,000 Cambodians, 10,000 Bhutanese, thousands of Mongolians, Salvadorians, Ethiopians, Somalis, on and on and on. So here's the question, why? And why are all these different people groups here? And what is the answer God's word gives in Acts chapter 17, verses 26 and 27. All these different people groups are here because God has overseen their travels to here. And brothers and sisters, God has brought them here for a reason. He wants every single one of these people groups to seek, find, enjoy, and worship him. And you know what? It's happening. It's happening through this church. I was talking just a couple of weeks ago with a woman from Iraq. Her family moved here from Iraq to Washington. Somebody invited her to church. She came, sat in the service here. She said the whole time she was sitting here, she was just weeping, overcome with emotions, and she didn't know why. And the days to come, she started to have dreams about Jesus in the middle of the night. 
So she kept coming to church to learn more about him. And after months of coming here, she came to faith in Christ. At the volunteer appreciation night this last week, a Filipino woman told about how she was out in the lobby after the service, began a conversation with a Persian woman from Iran. The woman was Muslim, but she had come here because she had had a strange dream about a man walking on the water. So the Filipino woman told her about Jesus walking on the water, and the Persian woman broke into tears. The Filipino woman shared the gospel with her, and the Persian woman gave her heart to the Lord out in the lobby. Last night, just last night, I was talking before the worship gathering last night with a woman from Afghanistan. She moved to uh, D.C. many years ago with her family. Last year, a member of McLean at Loudoun invited her, this woman, to start studying the Bible with her. They started in John, and within a couple of weeks, she had come to faith in Christ. Now, this woman in Loudoun, let me invite Dr. Birdie to join me up here uh, real quickly because... Um, this woman who is a, a member of McLean at the Loudoun campus uh, met this, this other woman from Afghanistan and she was in the middle of getting trained on how to share the gospel with Muslims. And so Dr. Birdie, many of you may know, you may not know, so he directs uh, ministry when it comes to Muslim Christian relations uh, across McLean. And is, is training, so how does training work? How are you all training folks across this church when it comes to sharing the gospel with Muslims? Yes, we, uh, I run classes here for uh, Christians to know how to answer the Muslims' question. Why do you believe what you believe about Jesus? Taking Muslims from their belief in God to the full gospel about God's love and salvation in Jesus Christ. We run these classes here. Uh, and uh, soon we'll have another class. Look to the bulletin, wait for it, and please come and join the class. Till now, we have around 400 people joined this class here and in another two campuses. Mm. And so this, that, that particular story, uh, as this uh, woman came to faith in Christ from Afghanistan, she, uh, uh, somebody was in the class, and, or was taking the class, and then came into class one day and just said, hey, I got good news. Yes, even we have, we ask the class members to bring their Muslim friends with them to mm. attend the class. And strangely enough, we have two uh, from these people who came. We have about 15 or more came uh, and attended the class and two of them gave their life to Christ. Mm. Do doctor, yeah. Dr. Birdie is originally uh, from Egypt, was a medical doctor in Egypt, then went and uh, served for the spread of the gospel in Nigeria and England, and then moved here about 11 years ago. And, and so, obviously, this is happening here. How is that connecting with what's going on um, overseas when it comes to refugees in particular? Yes, we, we have a ministry among the refugees in the Middle East, and uh, also uh, last month we started to do it in Germany. We are trying to reach to the refugees because uh, many of them are coming to know Christ, as you heard from David. And when they come to know Christ, they come with their idea about God of Islam. And we are trying to, be, to take them and uh, root them into the word of God and the Bible. So it is a leadership training program, and we run it in the Middle East. And we have uh, many Muslims and Muslim background believers come to the conference. And uh, I can tell you, the Lord is great in his work among these people. Muslims are coming to know Christ, and we are praying that they will bring a great move to Europe. So it is a move of immigration, but also it is the move of the Holy Spirit among the people of mm. God there. Mm. So I would just ask, how would you encourage us as a church when it comes to, well, how, how many Muslims are there in the Metro Washington area? And then what, how, 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 what would you say just to encourage followers of Christ when it comes to what we're seeing here in the Word? Yes, the conservative estimation of Muslims in greater Washington, D.C. area, they are quarter a million, 250,000. This is very conservative estimation because I am Arab man. We have around 150,000 Arabs in the greater Washington, D.C. area, but 60% of them are Christians. Uh, and uh, here among us in the church in the last three years, we saw at least 10 people uh, came to know Christ from this background. Hmm. 
Dr. Birdie's information, I think, has been or will be up there on, on, and, uh, on the screen. And then uh, after the gathering here at Tyson's, he'll be out in the lobby. Uh, I will be in front ask. of the Connect room. And please come and ask your question. And uh, take our email, send the email. We are willing to answer your question. Uh, we are willing. We are a, a group now. It is not me alone. It is Christian Muslim Relation Group. We are willing to help you answer your question. Come and visit your friend and try to help you in any ways to answer the question, why do you believe what you believe about Jesus to your Muslim friend, colleague, or neighbor? Amen. Okay. Can you thank God with me for that? Thank you very Thanks, much. Thank you. Amen. Ah, I, I got to tell you one more story. Got, got to, one more. Uh, so, uh, so this picture of the nations coming together. So uh, a Latin American woman who's a member here, uh, uh, works as a real estate agent, was telling me just this was a couple weeks ago. She was doing an open house that a fellow agent had asked her to host. And she really didn't want to do it, but she wanted to be kind to this other agent. So she said yes. She said she sat there all day at this house and nobody came except for one college age guy from India. And the only reason he showed up at the house was to sell some lawn services. Well, the, this Latin American woman says to this Indian student, goes to the door, he's trying to, she's like, I don't live here, but I don't think it's an accident that I'm here and you're coming to this house, so I've got something to share with you. So she shares the gospel with him there on the doorstep and invites him to church. Well, he says he might come. He gets her contact information. He walks away. She's not really sure if he's going to come. So the next weekend, she actually comes to the service on Saturday night. On Sunday morning, she's still in bed, but she gets a text from this guy saying, hey, I'm on my way to church. Can you meet me there? She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I went last night, so I'm not going to be there this morning. She didn't know if that meant that he was going to change his mind, turn around, but he didn't. He came to church by himself. He sat down in the service, and it just so happened, this is a couple weeks ago, it just so happened that day I was preaching, I used an illustration of people who are in India without Christ. And he's sitting there, and he realized, that's me. After the service, he goes out in the lobby, finds somebody and says, can you tell me how to become a Christian? And within minutes, he came to faith in Christ. So do you see this? Do you see what, what God is doing? Like God is overseeing the movement of peoples to this place, to this city, this community, to this church. God is bringing the nations here. The purpose of God among the nations is not just playing out on the refugee highway in Syria. The purpose of God is playing out on the beltway of Washington. God is bringing the people groups of the world here. And it's clear he's the one who's doing it. So, all right, one more. This will be a really quick one. But one, one Persian woman came to the office a few weeks ago, walked up to the front desk and just said, how can I know more about Jesus? I, who, how else can you explain that? But God is doing this. God is overseeing the movement of people to this place, this city, this community, this church, to your spheres of influence in this room. And this is the word he's speaking to McLean right now, today. God wants to use your life, your life, your family, this church, McLean Bible Church, to cause more people for more people groups to seek, find, enjoy, and worship him. It's not an awesome thought, an incredible word. So, brothers and sisters, based on the authority of Acts 17, verses 26 and 27, I exhort you today, live, work, pray, and toil for the spread of the gospel to the nations, to all kinds of different people groups right here in this city. May our lives, may this church be the place where in the providence of God, the lost from among the nations Find the God for whom their souls long. Amen. Amen. In just a moment, I want to pray toward that end. But uh, while the folks who are leading musical worship here and other campuses come out, I, I, I need to say this. Because I know that not every person in this room right now is a follower of Christ. And if you're not, I want to just speak to you specifically before I pray. 
The reality is every single one of us in this gathering today is a sinner before God, and we all deserve separation from him forever. But God loves us, and God has made a way for us to be forgiven of all our sin. He has sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross as a payment for our sin. And as Acts 17 goes on to say, Jesus has risen from the dead in victory over sin so that anyone in this gathering or anywhere in the world can be forgiven of their sin before a holy God by putting your faith and hope in Jesus. So speaking specifically to the non-Christian, what if God in his mercy, has overseen the movement of your life to bring you to this place right now where you are hearing this message. I do not believe it is an accident that you are here. I trust that God has brought you here to hear this good news, and today I want to invite you to believe it. Just like in all these other stories, I invite you to let today be the day when you put your faith in Jesus. God wills for you to seek, find, enjoy, and worship him. And in his mercy, he's brought you to this place at this time so that you might experience this reality in your heart.